It's possible that whilst sleeping, the hand that sowed the seeds of stars started the ancient music going again, like a note from a great harp. And the frail wave comes to our lips as one or two honest words. Welcome to this talk on the erotic contemplative, re-envisaging sex and sexuality. That poem by Machado speaks of one or two honest words. Whenever we deal with sexuality, especially in relation to spirituality, we need to be very aware that we're dealing with a great and very profound mystery. And the most we can hope is that out of our sense of the mystery and out of our own experience, we can say one or two honest words. But those are words that are very, very needed in our time and in our culture. I'd like to stress to the exploratory nature of all that I'll say in this talk. In some ways, I'm, I'm trying new categories, trying new ways of looking at sexuality, ways we might like to think, new ways of wondering. Nothing that I'm saying is prescriptive or proscriptive, all that I'm saying is exploratory, and perhaps some of it may speak to your heart and to your own exploration and to your own spiritual journey. That would be my hope. It's important that we be aware of the need that causes us to speak, that not just ourselves as gay and lesbian people, but the whole of our culture is very split apart in terms of spirituality and sexuality, not just divided, but in conflict with one another. Hence our incredible uh, condemnation of the sexual on the one hand and our absolutely obsessive uh, fascination with it on the other. These are two sides of the one coin of repression. So there is this crying need, I think, in all people, not just in gay and lesbian people, to find new ways of thinking about sexuality, keeping in mind always that it is fundamentally a mystery, which is alive in our bodies, but mysterious nonetheless. Needless to say, we can't do any of this unless we tell the truth of our experience and actually reflect on it. A, re a recent feminist theologian was writing that one of the problems in Western culture is that we've been quick to talk about the need for spirit or mind to rule the body and to rule its imperious passions. And that we've been less ready to talk about the gifts that body gives to spirit. And that's something of what I want to do in this talk, by looking at the truth of our bodies and the gifts they give us. I was noticing that this can even be very hard for modern day spiritual teachers. I recently looked at a new book called The Ground We Share by a Christian and a Buddhist uh, master, I mean two masters who are well renowned in this country and internationally. And of the whole book, maybe 10 pages even referred to sexuality, and most of those were on um, sexual misconduct of gurus, on issues of molestation of children, on celibate sexuality. There was virtually no reference, except maybe on one page, one or two pages, to sexuality at all. And this is 1994, and these are a Buddhist and a Hindu, a Buddhist, sorry, and a Christian teacher who are both well respected in New Age circles as well as traditional ones. What are we doing? Where do we expect our spirituality to come from? if we keep editing out the sexual. Part of the problem why this is so difficult, especially in the Christian tradition, in Christianity as we find it today, is that there's a tremendous climate of fear in the church with the current regime of John Paul II. There's also a great sense of fear in society um, as the religious right move forward and, and try to overthrow the little bit of sexual freedom that we have, the sexual exploration we're, we're engaging in. The second reason why it's difficult is that we have 2,000 years of not reflecting on our sexual experience, of pushing it aside, of repressing it, or at best ignoring it. So it's very hard to now come and talk about it. Thirdly, we have a tendency, both in our church and in our culture, to speak as if we know, as if we have the truth and we will communicate it to you. 
Now, sexuality is, is so complex and profound that no one has the full truth. And again, it's very hard for our church and our society to accept the exploratory nature of what we say about sex. Fourthly, of course, we all carry individually the legacy of shame, the shame of our conditioning, the shame our culture has taught us. And this also makes it difficult to speak. So all of our theology and our spirituality has been done in this climate. John McNeil, a, a Jesuit um, priest who was expelled from the Jesuits for his work with gay and lesbian people, says that all our wells, all our traditional wells of wisdom are polluted by homophobia. I'm sure Carter Haywood would add erotophobia. And so when we try and drink from these wells, it's very hard to get a pure taste of what they're saying to us. So the current situation in the church makes it very risky to do this work that I'm doing today. And therefore, the conversations that need to happen are not happening. People are tending to cover their backs and be careful in what they say. And desperate conversations that people are hungry for, discussions, not dogmas or doctrines, but just discussions, are not taking place. Please God, this class, this lecture, can be one of those conversations, one of those discussions. I would like you to take it as such. And secondly, even the most daring amongst our theologians tend only to focus on long-term monogamous relationships when they talk about sexuality. And the problem is that not all gay and lesbian people by any means live in long-term monogamous relationships. So a lot of our sexual experience is edited out, edited away. I remember uh, listening recently to Bishop Spong in, uh, in Melbourne, in Australia, where I live. One of the most daring and courageous uh, modern churchmen in the US. And when it came to talking about sex, he was quite eloquent. But towards the end, he stressed, I'm only talking about long-term monogamous relationships. Anything outside of that in, in terms of sexuality is destructive. Now, I think Spong has written somewhat differently, but this was what he said. I heard him. This sense of covering our backs, that we not be caught saying things we can be taken to task for. A second point that I would like to make in relation to this is that this goes against the wisdom that we have been given in our modern church. For example, the Second Vatican Council, one of the most seminal moments in the history of the Catholic Church and by implication the Universal Church, said in one of its most important documents, the Church in the Modern World, that what we have to learn to do is to listen to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit speaking in other cultures and in other religions. Now, this was a, a very important move away from the idea that we had the fullness of the truth and only we had the truth, to recognize the Spirit is alive in everyone. Now, this was a beautiful thing to say, and it's revolutionized a lot of our theology, but we don't do it when it comes to sexuality. We don't look at the sexual wisdom, the sexual traditions and customs, the religious practices that involve sexuality in other times and cultures and tribes, and listen for the Holy Spirit there. We, we edit out, again, the sexual. In all of this, underlying all of this, I believe, is the hidden and sometimes not so hidden understanding that sex is not good, that in some way it needs to be justified. Now, for most of Christian history, um, this was, was done by invoking procreation, that sex, and often it was said quite straightforwardly, that sex was an evil and it was justified by procreation. Now, we've, we've gone beyond most of this, but a lot of modern theologians and moral theologians are talking as if sex is justified in a long-term monogamous relationship, that this is what justifies sex. Now, personally, I can't see that this is such a great improvement. Um, we're still saying sex needs to be justified, firstly by procreation, now by long-term monogamous relationships. Now, something that needs to be justified is not inherently good. Now, we read in Genesis, I mean, it, it's fundamental stuff, that all that God created, behold, it was very good. Six times, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was very good, all of it. Now, surely, sex and sexuality, the very driving force of the universe, the juice for communion with other people and with God, 
has to come into that goodness, has to also be a central part of that goodness, has to share in that goodness. So therefore sex in itself does not need to be justified. It is already good. Sure, that's not to say that like any goods, food, sleep, drink, community, any goods can't be polluted or in some ways distorted or used in destructive ways. Of course it can. But therefore the criteria we need to look at are when might sex become not so good, not so helpful, not so uh, growth producing? When might it become a little destructive? Rather than when might sex be good? When might sex be justified? Which is the way we are still thinking in terms of, you know, it's justified for long-term monogamous relationships. This harks back to one of the ancient heresies in the church, the question of whether or not human nature is fundamentally good or fundamentally evil. Now, the idea that human nature is fundamentally evil was absolutely condemned in the early centuries of the church. Human nature is fundamentally good. Now, it seems to me that if human nature is fundamentally good, sexuality and sex, because really, sexuality and not engaging in sex is kind of a bit of an abstraction in, in this level of discussion, that sex and sexual relating are good in themselves as part, as integral to human nature. So, given all that, and that this is the climate in which we make these, uh, these explorations in this tape, that the church is still struggling with whether it can even begin to say sex is good or not, we um, move forwardly with great um, gusto and courage to suggest some far more radical ideas than just that sex is good. So please come along for the ride. Firstly, many today, um, not so much in the church, but also partly in the church, talk about the integration of sexuality and spirituality. And this is, of course, a great need. And there is some attempt to say even that sexuality and spirituality are the same, that they are the one energy. And uh, recently I heard even a, a Catholic contemplative monk who is involved in um, the guidance for younger monks in an order in Berkeley actually say that they are the same energy. Now, I think there's something in us that recognizes that this is deeply true. And it's a very, very appealing concept that sexuality and spirituality are in fact the one energy. And yet, it also seems to me, um, as a gay man, that when I look at a lot of what goes on in sex, say in San Francisco, in um, pornography, in a lot of, of the different writings that you read and practices that probably many of us have engaged in, some of that makes me feel it's not quite so simple. That yes, they are the one energy, and it's not quite that simple. Um, there's something in me that says when I see some of what goes on in sexual practices, this is not just all these people being holy or all these people doing spiritual practice. For some of them, I, I think it probably is. But for some of them, I awful, equally don't feel that this is, is the simple truth of all that is going on here. So what can we say? What could we possibly say about sexuality and spirituality? I'd like to offer you my, um, my exploration, one concept that I would like to suggest. It's, it's tentative, and in some ways it's bold but I hope it may be helpful as a way of wondering about sex and spirituality. The heart of, it is to, heart of it is to say, yes, they are the same energy. They are the same pure water of the uncreated life of God coming to us very directly in sexuality and in spirituality. It is ultimately the one water. And to back up this, this fairly daring statement, I'd like to read for you a couple of quotes from a very, very ancient text in Christian scripture called the Song of Songs, which may be familiar to some of you. And for 2,000 years, well, 2,500 years, there has been an argument going on among scripture scholars and theologians as to whether or not this is about sexual love or whether this is an allegory of divine love and human love, of the union between Christ and the church, the union of God and his people. So just, just listen to it as a sexual poem. These are just a few excerpts. Remember, this is 2,500 years old. Oh, for your kiss, 
for your love more enticing than wine, for your scent and sweet name. For all this they love you. So take me away to your room, like a king to his rooms. We'll rejoice there with wine. No wonder they love you. I sleep, but my heart stirs and dreams. My lover's voice here at the door. Open, my love, my sister, my dove, my perfect one, for my hair is soaked with the night. Should I get up, get dressed and dirty my feet? My love thrusts his hand at the latch, and my heart leaps up for him. I rise to open for my love, my hands dripping perfume on the lock. Oh, of all pleasure, how sweet is the taste of love. Your breasts will be tender as clusters of grapes. Your breath will be sweet as the fragrance of quince. And your mouth will awaken all sleeping desire, like wine that entices the lips of new lovers. Stamp me in your heart, upon your limbs. Sear my emblem deep into your skin. For love is strong as death, harsh as the grave. Its tongues are flames, a fierce and holy flame. Now, for 2,000 years and including today, they are still arguing, is this just a sexual poem or is this an allegory of the union of the soul with God? In other words, these two realities are so close that after all this time, we cannot still decide whether this is primarily this or primarily this. The, the realities are so much the same. I don't know about you, what I hear is something very erotic and very, very spiritual, and that's as it should be. This same text, the Song of Songs, is probably the most, if not one of the most, if not the most fundamental text in Christian mysticism. So much of our mystics and our spiritual writers draw from the Song of Songs when they try to express or image what it means to be united with the divine. It is to this erotic poem that they primarily draw their imagery and their sources and that they return. This too is saying something very powerful about the union of sexuality and spirituality as the one energy. So I would like to offer you a very simple diagram, a very simple image of how I understand the sexual and the spiritual and their relationship to one another. Because as I said, although they are the one pure water, in some sense it's not that simple. So we'll look at this rather awful diagram that I have drawn up to uh, get some model, some image of what I'm saying. So here's a very simple diagram that I've drawn up which is actually supposed to be a river, um, amazingly enough, which runs in two courses. The river comes from a deep source underground, and that's why I haven't, haven't finished this. It, it goes underground into a hiddenness. As it rises from the ground with great um, power and richness, it travels along to, in one course for a while, but then it splits into two courses, which are roughly parallel which then spread out into all kinds of other streamlets and rivulets on both sides. Now, if we take this one to be the sexual and this one to be the spiritual, what I'm suggesting is that they fundamentally both come from the one source and they are the same water flowing from the hidden source deep underground right out into all the small rivulets, all the other streamlets as they spread out into the ground, giving life and bringing fruit. Now I'm suggesting that the nature of the water is that it wants to draw us upstream. We taste it and it wants to draw us back. We get that sense, like a salmon, that we're called to swim upstream toward the source. There, in fact, to die. Which may be something of the deep connection between sexuality and spirituality and death. 
As these two courses come closer together, they run more deeply and more richly, and they begin to overlap. Streams begin to move from one to the other, and even up here, there are occasionally streams that move closer and closer to each other. And in this I'm suggesting that in deep spiritual experience, as well as in deep sexual experience, firstly we taste the water of life, the water of God, at increasingly deep levels, and that it draws us closer to the other side as well. Deep sexual experience tends to draw us towards the spiritual. Deep spiritual experience tends to draw us towards the sexual. And gradually, as we go deeper and deeper into both, the water becomes one, and there is no way of differentiating between the sexual and the spiritual. And in fact, at this point, in some ways, both courses go underground. And we'll talk about that a little later in the, uh, in the lecture. Out here, where the water is spreading out and giving life, it can also uh, move into marshes and bogs and dead ends, so that people can be engaging in all kinds of sexual practices which may or may not be drawing them back down towards the source, but which, in which they are still tasting, in fact, the water. Similarly, in spirituality, people can be engaging in all kinds of spiritual practices which do not draw them back to the source, uh, maybe getting them bogged down in things like fundamentalism or dogmatism, but they are still in some sense tasting a little of the water and feeling something of its longing. So I am saying that in all sexual experience, no matter how simple and in some ways trivial it may seem, there is a real taste of the water of the divine and that that is, is essential to the, the delight and the lure, the enticement we feel when we have any kind of sexual experience, when we seek any kind of sexual experience. I'm also saying that, that is the enticement and the allure in any kind of spiritual experience too. It's the same allure. And its nature is to draw us deeper, to draw us upstream, again like the salmon, towards the source. Now we'll, we'll develop this image a little later on, but suffice it to say that the key thing I'm suggesting is they are the same energy in two sources, two courses to channels. I'd like to reminisce with you for a moment about what your first sexual experience was like, about what that first moment of orgasm was like, the first time you tasted it. I think there was probably a sense of, this is it. Wow! As if somehow you've touched the most delightful thing you've ever encountered as if or ever could encounter, as if everything you ever wanted or dreamt was happening in that simple one moment. This great awakening, which was at the same time this simple pure moment of intense pleasure. I, I think universally there is this feeling of this is it. This is it. Now if we could reminisce also for a moment about your first true spiritual experience, the first moment you truly felt the movement of the spirit of the divine within. I think there's the same sense of this is it. I've tasted it. It's come alive. This is it. This is what they're talking about. The spiritual truth present in us. These same dynamics, the sense of having found the essence, that which everyone is seeking, even in however small form. Again, it's the same essence, it's the same water that we're tasting. This, um, this pure and wonderful awakening uh, reminds me of a few different teachings I'd like to share with you. It's a very common teaching in a lot of Tibetan Buddhism and amongst a lot of uh, yoga practitioners. But at the moment of orgasm, whether consciously or unconsciously, everyone attains pure mind. We attain the purity of the essence of being whether consciously or unconsciously. I think too, for example, of something Heidegger said, which is that the mystery, the essential trait of the mystery, is that it is that which shows itself and at the same time withdraws. And that in those first sexual and spiritual experiences, we have the same sense. Here is the mystery, I found it. And at the same moment, it's gone. It withdraws. This is the nature of sexual uh, delight. It's also the nature of the mystery of God. 
I think too of one of our modern spiritual writers, John Donne, who says that underneath all of our other desires, there is the one pure desire, our heart's desire, which is the desire for God. And he quotes um, T. E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, who once had a, an old man who came out of the desert from nowhere and said to him, the love is of God and from God and towards God, and then went away again. And Lawrence remembered that all of his life. And John Donne uses that as a symbol to say that all of our longing, all of our desire, which is awakened by this, these first uh, experiences, is in fact the desire for God, the desire for the true, pure water. Starhawk says that sex is the manifestation of the driving force energy of the universe, that sexuality is an expression of the moving force that underlies everything and gives it life. And something D. H. Lawrence says, which I love, is that the magnificent here and now of life in the flesh is ours, and ours alone, and ours only for a time. We ought to dance with rapture, spiritual ecstasy, that we should be alive and in the flesh and part of the living incarnate cosmos. Again, the sexual and the spiritual united in one ecstasy of rapture. Susan Griffin says that the nature of all our wanting, all our desire, is that it leads us to the sacred. Julian of Norwich speaks of living in love's longing. And Julian was a great spiritual mystic. Every lover knows what she means. Irenaeus speaks of that the glory of God is the human fully alive. Fully alive surely involves the sexual. Jesus speaks of his gift as being to bring us life in, it, in its fullness. Truly this also involves the fullness of sexual being. Life, spirit, God, union, sex are all the one same reality, the same union, the same driving force, the same water that we seek to taste ever more deeply. It seems to me that the contemplative, and we're speaking in this tape about the erotic contemplative, the contemplative is a person who instinctively knows this, that there is one source, there is one energy, there is one desire, and the contemplative, most of all, is one who is prepared to sell everything and seek the pearl of great price, as the Gospel says. Who is prepared to make this longing and this search, this movement upstream to the source, the centre of his or her life. And rather than seeing sex as a distraction from this journey, from this search, we need to see it as one of the prime sources in which we taste the water, and in which we are drawn ever deeply, ever more deeply into the water. Sex is not a distraction from the spiritual. As the Song of Songs says, it is a flash of fire, a flame of Yahweh himself what, that we experience in erotic love, in erotic love making. So, what is happening when we have sex? Particularly it's sex at a deep level. It's communion, it's emerging, it's a oneness with our partner, and with the universe. It's a self-transcendence. Even in simple sexual pleasure, you can watch someone's face and see the ego boundaries beginning to dissolve, seeing the hard sense of self softening as they enter into their pleasure. At its highest form, of course, it's a total, self, it's total ecstatic self-transcendence. It's also a deep acceptance of ourselves, of our vulnerability, and acceptance of the other in vulnerability. It's also, I think, primarily a sense of presence. The now is very intense and very real. You can't be fully present in sexuality unless all of your mind, your heart, your body is focused on what is happening in the body in the presence of sex. Fantasies, though they can have their use, tend to split us off from that. And we need to return more and more to just the simple presence of pure sex. And there is always, a, it seems to me, a taste of the inarticulable. No matter what we say about sex, we know we haven't got it. We haven't said what needs to be said. We haven't summed it up. There's something that eludes us in anything we say about sex, anything we think about sex. That's probably why we say so much, because we can't get it. It's mystery. It's a taste of the mystery couple of lines from this modern theologian I was mentioning, Mary Palauer, when she speaks of the 
skin of the lover of the beloved as an icon of the universe, a window into the mystery of the universe. Myself, I remember an intense experience of lovemaking when it suddenly flooded through me that I didn't know who it was I was making love to. Not just in the sense that I may not have known this person's name, but rather that I was making love to someone at a profound level and it wasn't simply this person here. I think many of us have had that experience, that we are in some way in communion with the divine mystery in sex, in lovemaking. How can we possibly, possibly doubt the holiness of sex, the sacredness of sex, the spirituality of sex, when these terms of merging, of self-transcendence, of oneness, of communion, of vulnerability, of absolute presence, of the inarticulable mystery, are the very terms we use about spiritual experience. They're the very categories we go to to talk about spiritual experience. Sexuality also brings us into them. So we taste something of God and it is through our bodies and it is through our pleasure, this deeply spiritual experience. We are one bodily and spiritual reality. Now compare this with the incredible body negativity that we have been handed by our church and by our culture. The fear of pleasure. One of the um, things that came from the Middle Ages was the idea that it was okay, for example, for men to have erections. The problem was to enjoy them, to enter into the pleasure. That was the issue. Enjoying the pleasure, that was where the sin was found. This fear of pleasure, when in fact it's one of the greatest gifts of God, John Giles Milhaven, who's again a modern theologian, says this, that real pleasures are dangerous because they are real. We know we're, in a sense, tasting the truth. And they give the person who feels them a touchstone of reality. They are most dangerous because they can peel off from the person's sensibility the crust formed by the vanity, the bustle, the irony and the tedium of the world. They peel off the crust. Such pleasures make the person feel that he is coming home, she is coming home, recovering themselves, who they truly are. In other words, if one is open to these pleasures, one, experience, one, recover, one experiences one's recovery of self, true self. Now, that, actually, that quote actually comes from a section where he is quoting C.S. Lewis and his screw tape letters and Screwtape, who is the devil, an image of the devil, is complaining that people should not be allowed to experience these sorts of pleasures because they, they enter into the true self and they open the person to God. So Screwtape wants to stop this kind of pleasure. One wonders what the church has been doing for so long, playing Screwtape's game, stopping people from experiencing the fullness of pleasure, which leads us into ourselves and into God. This, I think, is something that all true lovers know, that deep pleasure takes us deeply into who we are and opens us to the other and to self-transcendence. It's also something that all, all true saints know, that deep pleasure is at the heart of spiritual experience. This is why they break out into such ecstatic language, as we'll see in a little while, because they know the depth of pleasure. There's something very extravagant about the sensuousness of God, have you ever walked along a beach at sunset and just felt this is completely over the top, this riot of sensuality with sound and taste and smell and vision, this gorgeous lovemaking with the sky and the earth and the ocean. This is what God gives us, drawing us into a sensual experience of the divine in creation, in all things. Truly, I want to say that our God is a sensuous and loving God and the deep pleasure real pleasure, true pleasure, is her epiphany, is her embrace, and is her enticement. So unless we open our souls and our souls to true pleasure, we can never really advance, never really deepen our spiritual lives. And indeed, why would we go on this journey at all if it was not for the pleasure beyond pleasure? Now, none of this denies that we can get stuck and dissipate our energies in mindless rather than mindful pleasure-seeking. 
But to deny the richness of this reality for the sake of some of the risks is to deny life itself. So, the person who is newly awakened in sexuality and spirituality sets about seeking more of this water, tasting more deeply. Religious activities, once routine, become filled with joy and meaning and, and the presence of God. Sexual experiences, our sleeping bodies, come alive with a sense of juiciness and delight. And we experience our longing, our longing to go deeper. And this is really what this awakening is for, to seduce us, to entice us deeper and deeper into the water. As we go deeper, following our diagram, as I was saying, we find that our sexual experiences and our spiritual experiences start to overlap and become one. And our longing leads us into this union of these two. At times you don't know whether you're longing for God or longing for the beloved to make love with you in the afternoon. It becomes the one thing. And the image of God as the divine lover, which is so universal in spiritual traditions, what are we talking about? We're talking about the one longing, the one desire. I'd like to read a few quotes from people who make love, and then a few quotes from people who have had deep, deep spiritual experiences, and you can listen to the crossovers. At the moment of, uh, uh, sorry, at the moment of orgasm itself, I melt into existence, and it melts into me. I am most fully embodied in this explosion of nerves and also broken open into the cosmos. I am rent open. I am cleaved and joined not only to my partner, but to everything, everything as my beloved, or vice versa, has also become me. The puny walls of my tiny separate personhood drop so that I, you, he, she, we, they, it are one or they build up so thoroughly that all of me is one. And if I let myself love, let myself touch, enter my own pleasure and longing, enter the body of another, the darkness, let the dark parts of my body speak. As I enter into the body's language, tongue into mouth, a part of me believes that sorry, a part of me that I believed was real begins to die. I descend into matter. I know I am at the heart of myself and I cry out in ecstasy. For in love, we surrender our uniqueness and become world. And from a mystic, from the depths of God's wisdom, he shall teach you what he is and what wonderful sweetness the one lover lives in the other, and so permeates the other that they do not know themselves from each other. But they possess each other in mutual delight, mouth in mouth, heart in heart, body in body, soul in soul, while a single divine nature flows through them both, and they both become one through each other, yet remaining all themselves. From Beatrice of Nazareth, a, a mystic from the 16th century. St. Teresa of Avila has that famous passage where she speaks of an angel standing next to her and driving a fiery dart deep into her heart and then drawing it out. When he drew it out, I thought he was drawing out my entrails, and with it he left me completely afire with great love for God. The pain was so sharp that it made me utter several moans, and so excessive was the sweetness caused by this intense pain that one can never wish to lose it, nor will one's soul be content with anything less than God. It is not bodily pain, but spiritual, though the body has a share in it, indeed a great share. Or John of the Cross, who says, Upon my flowery breast, kept holy for himself alone. There he stayed sleeping, and I caressed him. And the fanning of the cedars made a breeze. The wind blew from the turret as I parted his locks, and his gentle hand wounded my neck and caused all my senses to be suspended. I remained lost in oblivion. My face I reclined on my beloved, 
and I abandoned myself, leaving my cares forgotten amongst the lilies. Now, who is speaking of lovemaking and who is speaking of divine union? You see how as the mystics come closer to the sexual, to come deeper in the water, they begin to use sexual language. As people having deep sex come closer to the deepest water, they begin to use mystical language. The two begin to become one. One hardly knows where one begins and the other ends. Now, I'm not necessarily totally equating all deep lovemaking with the heights of mystical experience experienced by the saints, but there is definitely the same water, the same energy at work. We'll say a little more deeply about, a little more about this later on. So also, as I was indicating in the diagram, as the, the two channels, the two energies, the two ways of experiencing the water come closer together, they also, in some sense, go underground. Now, in the spiritual life, this is referred to as the dark night of the soul. It's a term probably being used and abused a little much these days. In contemplative literature, it really refers to a deep and very searing death of the self, a total remaking of the whole person which shakes up all their understandings of themselves or God or life. Um, it also is often used in terms of ordinary emotional pain, but technically it really is a very specific moment in the spiritual life, which not everyone comes to. It's a very deep level of prayer, even though it feels like the whole personality is falling apart. Now, I'd also like to suggest that, that as this water of sexuality comes deeper and flows in with this same stream, we begin to experience possibly a kind of a dark night of sex. Now, this is something I've never heard anyone talk about, but what I have heard people talk about is, and even people who have a lot of sex and a lot of deep sex, a kind of a death, a dying, an emptying out of sex and of what it means for them, that um, there is a, an unease, a, a sense of this is not enough, there needs to be more here. Um, and often then are looking for a deeper spiritual life, a more contemplative way of being present, as if what gave them the taste before now is, is a little empty. It's still there, but it's, it's not doing what it was doing before. And I think this is a kind of a, if used well and wisely, can lead us into a, a kind of dark night of sexuality, where sex too becomes emptied out and allows us to become emptied out and enter into a deeper life of the spirit. This was partly why I was not equating totally deep sexual experience with deep spiritual experience, the deepest spiritual experience, because the mystics have been through this dark night. And I think that in going through the dark night fully, we also have to go through it sexually. And some of our, our sexual delight and our sexual joy and some of our sexual experiences have to fall apart too. But I think this can happen in quite ordinary ways. Um, someone commented once that you can obviously tell that the church's sexual teaching was written by celibates because anyone who's in a, in a long-term monogamous relationship or has a lot of sex knows that sooner or later the problem is maintaining desire, not controlling it, maintaining the ardor, not, not suppressing it, that there is a kind of limitation to some of the sexual drive and some of the sexual desire we have if it's given its full freedom. Sooner or later we want want it to go even deeper than it seems able to do. We want to have it bring all of our life together. We want to experience what we're seeking in the whole of our lives and not just in moments of sexuality. Um, I remember for myself that I have compared um, great moments of sex and moments also in working with Joe Kramer in some of the uh, erotic massage to great moments of religious um, ritual, great moments of liturgy when all the senses are rioting and it's, it's just fullness and wonderful. But sooner or later, there's something in us which wants a cleanness and a dryness, uh, a purity, a desert almost, as we'll see in our next tape, which leads us in a different way, in a way that some of the riot of the senses can't lead us. And as I say, I think this happens in sexuality too. If we are open to it, and if we don't turn around and just seek to recreate the old thrill which one of the, is the great, one of the great dangers in the spiritual life. We try to recreate the thrill we used to have in um, religious experience. And in sex, we can try and recreate the thrills all the time, rather than go through the emptiness into a deeper way of being, both spiritual and sexual. 
So the two become one, as I was saying, deeper and deeper as, as these dark nights are experienced particularly. And we understand viscerally, experientially in our bodies that there is only one life. This is not a disembodied state, this deep state of fullness of maturity, fullness of spiritual union. The great image of this, of course, is the risen Christ. The risen Christ is a bodily presence. The uh, gospel writers are at great pains, repeatedly, to try to point this out to, um, in their stories of the apostles seeing the risen Christ and in their message, therefore, to the communities they're writing to, that there was something very physical and embodied about this new way of living. And that's what it is for us. If we go into the deep places of the spiritual life, we become more embodied, not less embodied, more fully who we are sexually and physically, not less. There is no um, rejection of the body. And if there has been, and you see this in the mystics, sooner or later, it has to be accepted and embraced anew. It gets caught up in spiritual experience, whether they like it or not, and some of them don't like it, uh, feeling the body is back, and it's back in a new and holy way. It's interesting to me, for example, that when we look at the story of the woman of Samaria, the woman who went to the well, we find that this woman was a woman who had had a very, shall we say, checkered sexual background. She'd had at least five husbands. Um, the man she was living with was not her husband. And Jesus somehow knows this when he talks to her. And it is to this woman, to this woman with this very checkered sexual past, that Jesus says, if you had known who I am, who I was, you would have asked me and I would have given you living water that would become a well within you springing up to, to eternal life. It's as if he expects this woman will know something of what he's talking about. It's a fascinating image, the prostitute, more virtually a prostitute, and this, this man offering the living water, presuming they speak something of the same language. I believe they do. So, this is something of what I would like to suggest is happening when we have sex, when we have a deep sexual life and a deep spiritual life, when we refuse to buy the dualism that we've been sold by our society and our church. I do think, though, that there are other things happening when we have sex. As I pointed out at the beginning, I don't think it's this simple. So what else is happening when we have sex? What else could be happening with, when we have sex? What, why is it not that simple? Um, is there some healthy or wise uneasiness that rises up in us when we see some of what goes on in the name of sex, and sometimes in the name of spirituality too? I think it is a very mixed reality. Annie Sprinkle has used the image of sex as food, there being junk food and, and gourmet food and junk sex and gourmet sex. I would like to extend the metaphor to say there can be junk food sex, there can be um, wholesome home-cooked meal type sex, there can be romantic dinner type sex, there can be gourmet sex, and there can be Eucharistic sex, just as there can be all those levels of food. In all of them, note, please, that we are dealing still with food. We are dealing still with sex. The same water, in other words, is flowing through them all. But there are different qualities. Someone who's living their life on junk food or on junk food sex is not going to be all that healthy, and we're not going to feel all that good about a lot of the meals we see them eating. And we would like to tell them there are other ways, more enriching ways, more nourishing ways of doing this. Similarly with sex. Similarly, I might add, with spirituality and religious customs and practices. When we look at some of what passes for religion, some of what passes for spirituality, especially in this culture of the US, we want to say this is junk food. Or even worse, this is positively um, harmful to the body, not just the body of the individual, the body of Christ, the body of the world. Some of this stuff is not healthy at all. And personally, I'd feel far more sure saying about that about some of what passes for religion than I would about some of what passes for sex. Because I, I do believe there is always something of the true water in whatever sexual practices we have. Even in our um, neuroses, in our pathologies, in our mess that we're working out in sex, we're still seeking something good, still seeking delight, still seeking the water. Even Aquinas says that 
when a person has adultery, commits adultery, what they're seeking in adultery is the delight. They're not seeking the evil. They're seeking the good in adultery, the delight in adultery. I feel that's very true in all of our sex. Fundamentally, we're seeking some kind of wholeness, however messed up and, and mixed up it may be. When I look at the fundamentalists, who I would maybe not even put on the same par, but when I look at the fundamentalists, I find it hard sometimes to believe that what they are seeking is the true taste of God. In any case, we know that in both of these dimensions of our lives, we are experiencing mixed realities. So I think one of the things that's happening when we, when we see people having all kinds of sex is that they're seeking the water, but they're mistaking the context for the substance. Remember I was talking about the first time you experience this and you feel this is it? And there can be a danger that we grab onto the substance, the context in which that happens, and we endlessly try to recreate that context with ever more interesting and exotic variations, instead of realizing that what we're seeking is the taste of the pure water, and allowing that longing to lead us deeper and deeper, and let go of the context, the particular context in which we first experienced it, so that new and more surprising and more enriching ways of experiencing it can open up to us. So we tend to cycle around in a kind of caught or stuck pattern in the same practices over and over again and never move deeper. I think another um, thing that can be happening when we're having a lot of sex, a lot of different types of sex, is that people are in fact coming to know themselves. They're coming to find who am I, what do I want, what do I desire, what happens if I have it, what is going on inside me. And sex is a teacher par excellence of this. If we really follow it reflectively, and that's the key thing. Remember I was saying earlier, having mindful pleasure rather than mindless pleasure. If we have mindful pleasure, we can find what our fantasies are, we can find our darkness, we can find the issues around dominance, around submission, um, issues of power and control, issues of self-destructiveness, issues of compulsivity, issues of obsessiveness, issues of delight, issues of what gives us pleasure, what does nourish us, what does open us, we can find who we are. Who is this inside? And sex is a, is a wonderful teacher in this, if we explore it and use it reflectively. So I think a lot of what people are doing in having a lot of sex is finding out who they are, who I am, what makes me up. And this is a wonderful and a beautiful thing. Um, it's especially powerful in coming to know our own darkness, who we really are and what we really are capable of in all areas, both, both in, in the most ecstatic and growth producing ways and in the most destructive and dangerous ways, coming to know who I am and find some balance in that. As we know from um, ancient Greek teachings and also in all religious teachings, know thyself is an absolutely fundamental maxim of all spiritual life. There can be no knowledge of God unless we come to truly know ourselves. And that means embracing and enter, enter, entering into sex, not denying it and pushing it away. This, of course, can be very unsettling. It doesn't always feel holy. Um, it can feel the opposite. We can feel as if the old self is falling apart, as if who I thought I was is being deconstituted. And that is right on. That is right on because that's what has to happen to find out who I am and who it is possible for me to be in the light of God, in the light and the dark of the divine, in tasting this water and bringing it into myself. If nothing else, it teaches us honesty and it teaches us to hold our judgments of other people because we now know who we are too and what we're capable of. We also know, particularly from the work of Jung, for example, that it is those who have not seen who they are, not seen all they are capable of, who are the most dangerous and the most destructive because they, they are repressing facets of themselves, and so that, that stuff will rise up and compel them to behave in all kinds of ways of which they are not in control. A third thing that can be happening is that people are learning to be comfortable with their bodies. Our bodies, as I was saying earlier, are so divorced from ourselves in this culture that a lot of this sexual exploration and sexual play, which can go on for years, is a learning to be comfortable with, with my bodiliness in all of its dimensions. 
And, and this is a beautiful and a wonderful thing, how we can be truly erotic with each other. It can also be people just seeking, sim simply seeking play, pleasure, delight, intimacy with other people, other men, other women, just to have the chance to touch and be touched, to feel a communion of bodies. This has been so pushed away from us, so denied us, that again we can spend years simply trying to redress the balance. And when we find that bodily intimacy, that warmth, whether it's in a hot tub or in a bed or you know, in a garden or in the bushes, when we start to feel some of this intimacy, some of this bodily connection, we want it forever. We don't want to lose it. And why should we? It's our birthright. Being holy does not mean that we have to give up plain, beautiful, bodily intimacy. So some of this sexual exploration is simply this. Um, you see this also, for example, in young men, young heterosexual men, who are having sex with, with every woman who works, walks past or trying to. I think a lot of what they're seeking is touch, is intimacy. And this is the only way they know how to seek it. And sometimes that's true for us. Many of us are going through a kind of adolescence in this as gay men and, and just seeking what we never had. So let's affirm this. Let's delight in this. And let's, whenever we feel inclined to judge someone's sexual experiences, however trivial and simple and mechanical they might be, and I'm thinking, for example, now of, of, of lots of cruising and casual sex, you know, sex in public toilets, sex in, in the bushes. Let's see that these are people seeking something which is fundamentally good and ask ourselves, well, why not? Why not? Why can't this too be something which leads us into the good and the holy? In all of this too, often when we're having sex, we're filling up the hole. We're filling up the emptiness, the loneliness, the pain that we feel. We're facing something of ourselves which, which is hard to face. Um, and we're experiencing some of its truth and its pain. Now this pain and hurt and loneliness can also feed into our addictions, our compulsions, our obsessiveness, the pain of our incompleteness as human beings. Now, this happens a lot, I think, in sexuality, working out our psychological and emotional shit. And fine, I think that's good. I think that's healthy. I think that can be wholesome, as long as we don't use other people and damage them, and as long as we don't get stuck in our own shit, don't get fully compulsed and addicted. If we do, the issue is not the sex, it's the addiction, it's the compulsion, it's the mess that is driving us into that space. And we need maybe to take a break, to, to breathe, and to look at the addictiveness and what the real issue is in our lives, rather than get away from the sex. The sex is not the problem, um, just as in a lot of other addictions. The issue is really, what am I seeking? What hole am I seeking to fill up in myself? And to that extent, the sex, even a sexual addiction, is a gift. In that it tells us there is something deeply in need here which must be addressed. Another thing that can be happening when we're having a lot of sex is we can be avoiding uh, love, we can be avoiding commitment, we can be avoiding the fear of hurt in those, in those experiences. Um, and we can also be at times avoiding the, the real pain and struggle of spiritual growth. Sometimes the, the boredom and um, emptiness that can come in spiritual growth can send us out to have more sex. And I think whenever sex is involved in avoidance, like of love or of growth or of true spirituality, we have to really think seriously about why am I having this? What is really going on here? So all of this to say, is to say, and we could say a lot more, that no, when, when we have a lot of sex, we are not simply seeking for the taste of the water of, of God. There are lots of other things going on too, and we need to look at them very honestly and very reflectively and have mindful pleasure in the midst of them. This does not mean that they're all not good or that they're therefore not holy. They're holy insofar as they serve to contribute to the wholeness of our growth. And I believe that all of these different dimensions can in some ways be brought into and serve our spiritual journey, our growth to wholeness. We don't need to reject and push back any of them. We do need to be mindful and honest and open about what is happening in our sexuality. So all of this is to say also that while a lot of what we're having in sex is not so fantastic and not so great in some areas, it's also not so terrible either. 
and there is a lot more caring and intimacy and love involved in it than we perhaps at first expect or suspect. And for me, the most powerful evidence of this is the reality of gay men and AIDS. That during the 70s, people were having you know, sex, I mean, like it was going out of, you know, out of style, like it was the end of the world, and this was the last chance to have sex. And according to what we're told by the church and by some psychologists, this type of sex, this, and I might add, by the way, by some gay people, this amount of sex and this type of sex should have in, resulted in us becoming totally dehumanized, becoming very cold, very exploitative, very mechanistic in the way we approach people. Now, what did happen? I'm sure some of that happened, but it wasn't the full story. What happened was AIDS was discovered, AIDS emerged. And all of these people who've been having all of this sex, well, not all of these people, but an awful lot of them who've been having all of this sex, have become the most tender, loving, heroic, self-sacrificing, faithful people, demonstrating heroic love for the church and the world in a way that finds few parallels in human history. In other words, if we were to make a decision based on that evidence as to what all of this sex produced in terms of human growth, we would, I think we would have to conclude overwhelmingly that it allowed people, when the call came, when the need arose, to be heroically loving and heroically giving and this is one of the great gifts of um, gay men, I believe, to our culture. Two final comments uh, about people who have a lot of sex, about the experience of having a lot of sex in relation to the spiritual life. I was saying that it um, can teach us self-knowledge. One of the gifts of, of meditation, of contemplation, of course, is exactly self-knowledge, true self-knowledge, that all our shit comes up. It also comes up in sex if we're open. So I see a very deep parallel there. On a very profound level too, I think, one of the great fears we have in having a lot of sex and in, in watching people have a lot of sex and certain types of sex and experiencing our own desires for lots of sex and certain types of sex is the fear of losing control, the fear of chaos, the fear of losing myself. Now this is exactly the same fear in the depths of the spiritual life, the fear of losing control. And that is exactly what we have to go through and control is exactly what we have to lose. We have to let go of our lives. Again, I see a deep parallel and the possibility of one teaching and informing and gracing the other. So for me now, the most profound question that comes up is given all of this, given that we can cycle around on the periphery of these two deep um, rivers, these two deep streams, what will lead us deeper? What will lead us down and draw us down through the water to the place where those two streams become one, where the life is tasted at its deepest level and becomes one and goes underground into the mystery of God? And this is a very profound issue. What is it that will let us drop down or that will impel us like a salmon upstream? I spent a lot of time pondering this one. And finally, on a beach at Bolinas, what a beautiful place to be reflecting on this stuff. Bolinas is a, a coastal area north of San Francisco, beautiful coastal region. The answer came to me. The contemplative heart is what will draw us down, which is why I called this talk the erotic contemplative. Now, what do I mean by a contemplative heart? The contemplative heart is the heart which is able to fully, richly taste and enter into the fullness of everything that can be seen, touched, tasted, felt, experienced with the mind, the body, the senses. It can embrace it richly and fully and enter into totally the full revelation of itself and of God in those experiences, whether it's rituals, Eucharists, theology, scripture, sexuality, sunsets, oceans, lovemaking, anything that is of the senses and it speaks of the divine, the contemplative heart enters into and tastes it all vulnerably and fully and says no to none of it. This person is someone fully alive. The contemplative heart, however, is also totally able to let go of it all, to totally let go of all of that and say, not that, not that, not that to realize that anything which can be grasped or fully tasted or conceptualized has to be let go of 
and the person has to enter into the mystery of God, the silence and the darkness and the stillness where God is found beyond God, where there are no words, no images, no senses, no tastes, no sounds, the absolute void, the absolute silence, which I think is at the heart of all religions and certainly at the heart of Christian mysticism, even though it's often ignored and denied. Now, if a person can do that and fully taste the beauty and, and the energy and the joy of all that is sensual and that is conceptualizable, and at the same time say, not that, not that, they get out of this cycle of recreating the context, sort of chasing the thrills, and they can drop down every moment and, and reach it deeply and have another taste and let go of that and drop further down and taste it more deeply and drop further down until finally the tasting and the letting go absolutely become one in, in an inarticulable experience of the divine mystery. This is the gift of the contemplative heart. I, I, I need to return to this, this letting go, this not thatting that doesn't hold or cling to the experience. That's the great danger. This is mine. I have this experience. To let go of it and, and let our longing, this is again crucial, let the longing in our heart lead us deeper. Let it become our guide. John of the Cross says rather beautifully, we will go by night seeking the fountain of life. Only our thirst is our guide. Only our thirst is our guide. Never letting what we have experienced tell us that that is the full truth. Let our thirsting lead us deeper. As again Heidegger said, being attentive to the mystery which shows itself and at the same time withdraws, allowing us to follow that withdrawing into the silence and letting go. I was saying something about not clinging onto the thrills. Now, this brings up the issue which I mentioned earlier, which I think is very important, of the danger in sexuality, in spirituality, in life, in drug taking, for example, of seeking and clinging to the thrills. Now, in the spiritual life, what we're seeking is a transformed heart, is a totally surrendered being. We are not seeking simply the thrill of spiritual experience or the thrill of sexual experience. We are seeking to become that which we desire in the deepest level of our being, which is not about a momentary thrill, however holy it might be. Um, for example, Ram Das talks about, you know, Ram Das, who experienced with drugs with Timothy Leary, talks about trying to find how the drug experience could become the fullness of life and how he sought a, a guru in India to try and give him the LSD to see what would happen. He found one, he gave it to the guru, and the guru simply sat there, took the LSD, continued smiling quietly and didn't change at all. In other words, he already was totally embodying that which the drug momentarily, fragmentarily gave a sense of. I also remember that I once gave a group of uh, college students a task, one group to decide what was great sex, the best kind of sex, and the other group to decide what would a truly holy, mature person look like. We brought them back together and we answered each group's question with the other group's answers. We didn't tell them we were doing that. And what we found was they were virtually interchangeable. That what one group said was great sex was what the other group said were the qualities of a fully mature life in, in Christ, in God. And that is what we're seeking. But to have that, we have to be able to let go of the momentary thrills and seek the deeper truth. Now, for me, this also brings up the issue of, when we talk about momentary thrills, issues of long-term monogamy versus casual sex or multiple partners, which are in some ways different, and whether they can be part of the spiritual life. Um, I want to say, firstly, that in no sense do I in any way denigrate or um, put down long-term monogamous relationships. I think they are prof a profound gift to the church and to the world. They are a wonderful model of what true loving is, and there is a kind of growth and development that can happen in those relationships, which perhaps cannot be found anywhere else. I think they are wonderful gifts and holy gifts. But I don't believe that therefore everything else is to be shunned or regarded as worthless or as sinful or as not helping people grow. On the contrary, I believe there are all kinds of ways of growing and living and loving 
and that all of them can ultimately lead to our growth. Why can't we have both and rather than either or? Why does the goodness of one have to mean the evil of the other? I don't believe that that, that is the case at all. First principle, I think, in any of this is telling the truth. The fact is that many of us, most of us probably, have had all kinds of sex in all kinds of situations, or we know people who have, and we've seen that lots of those relationships, however momentary, can be moments of grace, wholeness and goodness, and can lead us into to deep life and move us forward on the journey. Now we have to tell the truth. Um, it's just because it may be respectable in some circles to deny that monogamous relationships are the only way, sorry, to, to, to state that monogamous relationships are the only way, just as it may be s sort of fashionable in some circles too to call everybody else a slut and pretend that I would never do that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm different from that. Um, the fact is that we know from our experience that all kinds of sex can be helpful. Let's own that. Let's admit the truth of that. Let's reflect on that. Let's integrate that. Let's find out what that's telling us about life and sex and spirituality without therefore having to put down people who have long-term monogamous relationships, which is the other side of the coin. Lots of people want to do that too. Let's accept the beauty and diversity of human beings, the beauty and diversity of being together, and the beauty and diversity of spiritual growth. I would also like to suggest, and this is going out on a limb, that in looking at a theology or a spirituality of multiple partners, we could even look at the theology and spirituality of celibacy. That surely it is possible that we can meet together for a brief time in a spirit of trust, openness and vulnerability, reverencing the other person for who they are, beyond the particularities of their ego, where they live, what their name is even, accept our common humanness and enter into a moment of deep shared mutuality, deeply um, vulnerable loving, experiencing each other at a profound level, experiencing the divine within, giving thanks for that, rejoicing in that, and then bowing and letting each other go, saying, I recognize the God in you, I give thanks, and I let you journey on, and I journey on. Richer for having been together, and no less rich for parting which, by the way, is one of the great lines about celibate spirituality, richer for being together and no less for parting. Could this not also be a model for how we could love, how we could love more than one person, how we could share our lives, even with a lot of people? I need to say again, I'm talking about a quality of sexual experience, a quality of sexual loving. I'm not simply talking here, I was earlier, but not here about simple brief encounters in the bushes. I am talking about deeply present, deeply sensual loving. And I believe it can happen and then be let go of. I think we can do a lot more thinking around a theology, a spirituality of this. I think it's very needed. This brings up the issue of discernment. And this is, is really where I would like to finish this tape, but I think it's a crucial point. In the mix of all this stuff that I've talked about, around all the kinds of things sex can be and is for different people at different times, long-term monogamy, spirituality, mysticism, multiple partners, all that kind of stuff. How do we discern? How do we discern what is growth, where we're moving, if we are moving, and if we're getting stuck? I had a dream about three years ago when I was, was trying to sort out some of this stuff. And in this dream, I was given three texts the Epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, the first Epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 9, chapter 11, and chapter 12. I'm sorry, chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 12. And this was early in the morning. I thought, what the hell is this? You know, so I waited until I woke up and then went and got the Bible and opened them up. And I'd like to read to you, just very briefly, what I got from those three chapters, distilled wisdom, I might add, it's not the whole chapter, and some exegetes would disagree with me. What I got was, for me there are no forbidden things, but not everything does good. True, there are no forbidden things, but it is not everything that helps the building to grow. So everything is permitted, given basic mutuality, basic respect for the other person, basic care of the humanness of each, each person. Everything is permitted, 
but not everything is helpful. So let's explore, let's play, let's be together, but let's be reflective about what is helping me to move, what is helping me to grow deeper here, what is helping my humanness, and what is not, and be prepared to let go of what is not, seeing where I'm getting stuck. That's the first level. The second level of discernment, which indicates where I should be growing, comes from chapter 11. And Paul is talking about um, the Eucharist. And he says, Everyone is to recollect himself before eating this bread and drinking this cup. Because a person who eats and drinks without recognizing the body is eating and drinking his own condemnation. Now, I think the second level of growth is that we are growing to recognize and reverence more and more deeply the God within me and the God within the person that I am making love to. So love making is becoming more and more a reverence and a profound and a holy thing. And I, I at times am overwhelmed with a sense of reverence for you and experience your reverence for me. There are no quick, easy jerk-offs in this. This is about really recognizing the divine within one another. And this, I believe, is, is the second level where we're growing into wholeness as a sexual being. Interestingly enough, what Paul is saying here, he's saying because rich people were coming to the Eucharist, eating lavish food and putting the poor people to shame. And Paul was saying, you know, you can't do this. You can't eat of this bread and drink of this cup and also shame the poor. You must recognize the body. And he means the body of Jesus in the Eucharist. He also means the body of the poor. So I think the second level, we're also growing to reverence and respect the divine within all people. And so I think we're gaining a deeper sense of social justice, a deeper sense of, sense of care for the oppressed. And I believe, therefore, our sexual lovemaking should spill over into the way we would treat everyone, especially those who are most rejected, uh, especially those who are most oppressed by our society. This person is becoming a person of justice. The third level, the deepest level, is 1 Corinthians 13. And I won't read this, we know it pretty well. This is Paul's hymn to love. That if I have, if I do all kinds of things with my life and have not love, it's a waste of time and energy. This is where we're reaching, reaching the communion of love, where all of our sexuality and all of our life is tending. This person is coming home and is reaching union with the divine. Everything is love. All relationships, all experiences with every being are love, come from love and lead to love. At this level, I like to say the true saint is someone who could have loving, ecstatic, erotic sex, divine sex with every being, and need have sex with none, because they are already living in the fullness of communion of love. So this is the first, this is the deepest level. I think this development of discernment from these three levels is not only linear, it's also um, circular. These three levels, well, particularly the first two, can, with, with flashes of the, of the deep love coming through, can be happening in our lives at the same time. That sometimes our sex is just, it's all permitted, but it's not all helpful. Sometimes our sex is positively divine in the true sense. And sometimes it's the fullness of a communion of love beyond even sexuality. But we will gradually be growing more and more to the second level and then to the third level. So I'd like to close with a simple quote from St. Paul. After all that's been said, after all that remains to be said, and there is a great deal that remains to be said, I've offered only hints into the, into the mystery, into the exploration that needs to go on. In the end, only three things remain. Faith as the response of the whole person, body, mind and heart. Hope as that which carries us through the night and the uncertainty and the pain. And love. And the greatest of these is love.